Hello, I'd like to welcome you today to the Master of Computer Science at ASU webinar, admissions webinar. My name is Diana Sunshine, and I am part of the Coursera team that works with ASU's MCS department. And we're really excited to meet, um, have you on our webinar today. Um, I want to show you a little bit and walk through a little bit with you about how the Zoom interface works. If you scroll down to the bottom, you're going to see that there's a menu and you can actually click on the chat icon. And if you will, it would be great if you put down your name and where you're um, kind of coming in from, where are you logged in from. And so we can see that we should have people from all over um, the world coming in. We have um, hundreds of people um, from everywhere. So I see that we have Ying from China. We have Nicole from Arizona. We have Saudi Arabia, Chile, Brazil, India, Frankfurt. Oh, this is awesome. So um, you can see that this is one of the strengths of this international program is that um, being um, not only learning um, computer science, but you also get to be learning it with people from all over the world. So the other thing I wanted to highlight is there's a Q&A button. So if you have questions, it's best if you put your questions into the Q&A. When it gets just um, put into the chat, it can easily get lost. So um, anyway, we're very, very excited um, to have you all here today. And I am going to turn it over to the um, ASU team to um, kick it off. So Anita and Christina. Thank you, Diana. Uh, so I'm Christina Sebring. I am a, an academic advisor for the School of Computing Informatics and Decision System Engineering here at ASU. Uh, so I am the primary advisor for all the students in the program. Uh, also on chat, you'll see uh, Nicole Placecki. She is our Student Services Coordinator Associate. So she works very closely with the Admissions Committee and is very familiar with the process. Uh, so she'll be able to answer um, some of your questions that may come through chat uh, as we're going through the webinar. Thanks, Christina. I'm yeah. Anita Chavla. I work with uh, Christina and Nicole very closely on this program, on the delivery course development, and I also work on several other initiatives here at ASU, all in the Open Scale Initiative, and the Master of Computer Science program falls under this initiative. So very excited to be with you here today, this morning, yes. or afternoon, or evening. <laughs> you are. Today, right? <laughs> So uh, agenda of what we're going to cover, we're going to give an uh, overview of the MCS program, uh, talk about what the admissions requirements are, what the application process looks like, and then finally get to your questions. So we'll try to get to as many questions as we possibly can to get those answered live here today. Um, I did, here's a really good reminder, as Diana said, if you could use the Q&A function, it really does make it a lot easier for us to see your questions. So, the, so they don't get lost. So if you could use that feature to post your questions, it'll make it easier for us to answer them at the end. Um, so what is the Master of Computer Science program? Um, so first of all, why do you want to pursue uh, the ASU MCS degree? Uh, ASU is number one in the US for innovation. Um, so it's ahead of big universities, such as MIT and Stanford, and that's four years running. So that's a, a big I guess a big statistic for us, a big award. Yeah. Uh, we also have some of the best online programs for graduate engineering. Uh, we're the number one uh, public university chosen by our international students. Fulton Engineering, which computer science falls under Fulton Engineering at ASU. We are the largest engineering school in the country. Um, and then SIDSI, uh, SIDSI is also one of the largest Fulton schools as well. So we have almost 5,000 undergraduates. Um, and around 1,400 graduate students. I mean, that's a, that was as of fall 2017, so we probably have even more now. So we're a large school. Um, so the online computer science program is a rigorous computing degree. Uh, covers big topics as artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, big data. Uh, we're running a blockchain course this semester. So a lot of big, hot topics in the industry. Uh, we, we organize our courses into different areas, if you will. So we have some courses that cover foundations, um, some systems courses, applications courses, and then we have a bucket that we refer to as electives. So there's a couple um, 400 levels and some special topics like blockchain. Um, there's one in development for deep learning. So those are definitely important topics. Uh, we have classes coming out in the fall in security and, um, and big data classes that are currently running. Uh, employers. So ASU, uh, we have a, our on-campus program, which has been around for many, many years, has a 90% employment rate for graduates of that program. 
Um, so very good employment rate. Um, our graduates take skills they're learning in the program. They develop leading edge applications in technologies and global companies. Uh, so some of those are appearing on your screen, such as Amazon, IBM, Intel, PayPal, and that's just to name a few. So our graduates go on uh, all over the world to work in the field. And just to yeah. add, I'm a proud ASU alum as well. So very oh. proud to be affiliated to this program and work with the department on helping all of us find future skills in very important areas in the IT industry. So I guess admissions requirements, that's a, definitely something everybody wants to know is how do I get into the program? Right. <laughs> Um, so high level overview, um, the program is 30 credit hours, which is 10 classes. Uh, the cost is uh, $15,000, but it's charged as you take classes. So it breaks down to $500 per credit hour or $1,500 per course. So if you only take one course, you're only charged the $1,500. Um, so that's a, an important question we get is program cost. Mm -hmm. uh, we have three starts a year, so fall, spring, and summer. So our upcoming start is summer, which starts May 20th. Uh, it is a project-based program. So the culminating event is a portfolio. So it's, um, it's something you, you work on as you complete your courses. So you complete projects within the courses themselves, and at the end, you can submit a portfolio. So it's a, something you do as you go. So no one, I guess, small extra step at the end, if you will. We do have financial aid options available, um, such as grants, loans, um, and some other things from outside sources. Um, that's, of course, subject to availability, um, and it's determined on an individual basis, but there are options available. Uh, getting into the requirements, uh, our minimum GPA requirement is a 3.25 uh, on the U.S. scale, um, and that's in the last 60 hours or the last two years of the undergraduate or our bachelor degree. Um, now, if you are coming, you know, your undergraduate degree was completed in a country other than the U.S., um, please enter your GPA when you apply as it appears on your transcript. So we, your transcripts are evaluated, including your GPA, based on the country where the education took place. So as you saw on a previous screen, ASU is a big choice for international students, so we have a lot of data and a lot of reference points to be able to evaluate those transcripts. So please just enter information as it appears. Don't, you don't have to try to convert that or do anything with that. Uh, we do require math. We have a math requirement. So at least two semesters of calculus, which is calculus one and two, um, and a background in discrete math. And that does need to be completed at the time of application. So at the point you submit your application, you should have those math grades posted on your transcript. Um, moving on to transcripts. <laughs> ASU does need your official transcripts, and there are options to have those sent here. There's many on our website under the FAQ. There's a few highlighted on your screen, um, such as parchment feed and um, attestations from the ministries of education, uh, things along those lines. Um, you can apply with your unofficials. There's some size constraints, and it has to be all one document, and it must be legible so that we can read it and evaluate it. Um, but you can apply with your unofficials, but you do eventually need to send your officials um, if admitted. Um, we also require a personal statement. So that is basically why, why do you want to do the program? What do you hope to get out of it? What do you hope to contribute to it? Um, about a page or two, um, just something however long it takes to uh, explain why you're interested in the program. Uh, and then the last, I guess, last part is the application fee. Um, it, there is a range posted on the, you'll see on the screen of 70 to 115. Um, that's determined on whether you're domestic or a U.S. student. Um, or if you're an international applicant. So that varies a little bit. Jim, want to add something? Yeah, so Christine, yeah. I wanted to talk about the GPA on the, on oh, the application. Yeah. Yeah. So I have my computer engineering undergraduate degree from India, and so I can see that we have many people on the webinar who are from that part of the world or got their degree from there. So when I applied to a program here, I didn't, as Christina said, don't convert it to a GPA. Just put your percentage, because we know what that percentage equates to. And if you have questions, we are going to give you some additional um, information of how you can contra uh, contact our enrollment services team. But we are here to help you with that. And regarding transcripts, I know that it might be a little difficult sometimes to get official transcripts, but there are also services like True Copy 
that uh, work very well in the Asia region that can get you official transcripts and that can be sent to us as well. So lots of options, please check our website. Thank you. Yeah. And one thing I actually forgot to mention is that our program does not require the GRE um, or letters of recommendation. So um, that's a, a common requirement uh, for graduate programs, which this program does not require. Good so, point. So you do not need GRE or letters of recommendation. So uh, our program does require some prerequisite knowledge because it is a rigorous program. Um, you, are, you do need to have a, a good understanding of some very important topics uh, that are typically taught at the undergraduate level. Um, so you are eligible for admission if you have at least uh, four of these topics, uh, which must include computer organization and data structures. Um, those are critical topics um, for a graduate level computer science courses. So that's why those are uh, um, a firm must, just like the, the math requirements. Um, but the other classes we're going we're gonna to look for are operating systems, um, principles of programming languages, uh, which is actually um, usually about a third year programming language class, um, about third in the sequence, so it's more advanced, um, deals with compilers or programming paradigms. Those are also common course titles we see on transcripts. Uh, theoretical computer science. Um, there are classes do have a theoretical um, undertone to them, if you will. So you do need to have some knowledge of the theoretical components. And then finally, a software engineering course. Um, now we do offer an online proficiency exam that's fully online. So we do see a lot who may have learned this, maybe not in formal academics, but through professional development or professional experience. So we do have an online proficiency exam that you can take to help demonstrate that. Um, so there is a link on your screen. It's uh, links.asu.edu slash MCS exam if you're interested in that. Um, it's fully online. It's online proctored. Um, costs about $46 um, to take that. So that's a, a good option for you and one that we, ex we extend as we review it, uh, applications and transcripts all the time. So if that's something you're interested in, um, it's a good option. Um, so international students, we, um, we do see a lot of international applicants. Um, so one big thing that we do require is proof of English proficiency. So you can submit that through TOEFL, um, IELTS, or PTE. Um, and that is required if your degree uh, was done outside the U.S. and the primary language spoken in that country was not English. So um, we do require the English proficiency in that circumstance. Um, visa requirements, if you are not a U.S. citizen but are currently in the U.S., uh, graduate admissions does need a copy of your visa. So you can send that directly to them. Um, and their email is gograd at asu.edu. Um, now, if you're not, if you're going to be completing this degree outside the U.S. and not coming, um, then when you apply, you're going to select JN as the visa type. That just means international, not coming to the U.S. So that's what you'll select, and then you won't get, your application won't get held up looking for visa verification or anything. So um, if you're not, if that's you, um, select JN at the beginning. Um, and then, yeah, we did talk about transcripts earlier. Um, and again, we do have some FAQs on the, on the website about options for that. Um, and I know Anita gave you some good suggestions for that on an earlier slide. So another common question we get is, what if I don't meet the GPA requirements, what do I do? Mm -hmm. uh, so we have what we call the MCS pathway option. So what this is, is it allows you to come in as a, a non-degree student uh, and take a few classes and establish a higher uh, graduate GPA. Uh, we've also seen a few students doing this who might be working on some prerequisite knowledge, so that, that's also an option because it's a, a non-degree path, if you will. Um, so once you take three classes, and if you earn a 3.25 GPA, which is equivalent to a B-plus average uh, in your first attempt, then you can apply to the degree program using that new GPA. So um, we have students doing this right now who are, taking, uh, who are in that pathway track taking courses uh, and working toward admission. Um, I, I guess the, because it, none of the prerequisites are checked, so the only thing is just to make sure you have the prerequisite knowledge going, because you are going to be taking these graduate level classes that do count for the, the degree program later. Um, so you just want to make sure that you have the prerequisite knowledge through self-study. Yeah. As Christina said, these MCS courses are the actual degree courses. Yes. So you're making headway into your degree right away. We're not asking you to take extra classes outside the degree program. Yes. Yes, so you could, you take three classes, you can 
bring those into the degree program mm -hmm. and then you would only have seven left after applying to the degree program mm -hmm. yes so you are, are making progress so it's a good way to I guess earn that higher GPA yeah so the application process um, so there is a link on your screen a direct link into the application um, if you're um, using our MCS website uh, there's apply now buttons that will also take you right into the, the application so there's many ways to get to our graduate application uh, from our website um, but again it's that link asu.edu um, slash MCS dash application um, so you submit the application you pay the application fee um, you send any you know documents if you have to send the officials or the English proficiency um, and then once everything's in it releases to the committee for review mm -hmm. uh, we do have an early deadline of March 15th um, so that's about a month away um, and getting your application in by the early deadline is gonna get you that early decision um, you'll have earlier access to our onboarding class um, which you know teaches you program requirements and about the platform so you can have that done out of the way before classes start on May 20th so you're all set and ready to go um, you know at a comfortable maybe more relaxed pace yeah. um, if um, but the final deadline for summer is April 15th so um, that's the final deadline to get your application submitted to be considered for um, summer 2019 mm -hmm. and again that starts May 20th very exciting thank you Christina yeah There's a lot of questions coming so are there a lot of questions <laughs> okay um, so uh, what's on the screen right now is some contact information so we do have an enrollment team for the MCS online so a lot of times there might be questions that um, are, are specific to you and you want to you know talk to somebody so please contact our enrollment team that's why they're there um, if you prefer email um, their email uh, is there MCS enrollment at ASU.edu um, they also have a toll-free number 844-353-7953 um, and then our website, of course, has a lot of information. We have a really uh, well-developed FAQ section um, that we've, we've spent time and um, modified, I guess, over the, over the last year, yes. uh, fine-tuning that to what the frequently asked questions really are. Yes. <laughs> uh, so that's, uh, you can get to that directly, links.asu.edu slash MCS. Um, and then, of course, there's the link to apply again. Um, but that's about it for a formal presentation so we can we can transition into some questions mm -hmm. um, I know um, just to kick it off um, in case you haven't typed in anything into the Q&A um, some of our common ones are what do I do if I don't meet the math requirements um, that's one we, we see a lot um, we the calculus one and two are commonly offered if you're in the US at community colleges um, so that's if, if you are here um, you could certainly take that back take those there um, ASU online does offer calculus one and two as well so um, ASU has a, a standard non degree where you could come in you could apply and take those online as well if you're missing the calculus um, letters of recommendation are they required no they're not mm -hmm. um, in the application if anybody's in there or started it there are some instructions you have to enter one um, but you can just enter yourself that's fine you don't have to write anything um, it's just a, a a workaround for the system yeah, yeah <laughs> that's all it is uh, but we do not require them um, and then how do we calculate international transcripts so that's uh, a question we get a lot mm -hmm. um, so we we evaluate them based on the scale used in the country where the education took place uh, so in case you came in um, a little later um, ASU is a very popular destination for international students so we have a, a abundant amount of information that we can use to evaluate those transcripts um, and data points that we can use so we do evaluate it based on where the education took place um, we for international transcripts we focus on the math and the prerequisite coursework so we we look at you know is it there um, and how, how did you do <laughs> um, and then that 3.25 GPA varies by country um, in the US it's a B plus average and in India it's commonly um, the first class designation yeah. so if that helps at all um, about about where that is mm -hmm. um, but I think now we can probably get to some of the questions coming in online excellent well I'm gonna tee up some of the questions and I'm gonna do my best to bucket them because um, a lot of people ask somewhat similar questions um, so one that somebody said is um, kind of is there something that you value the most um, to help somebody get 
into the program? And, um, and is there any sort of understanding on acceptance rate? Do you want me to take that? Yeah, why don't okay. you take that? Um, so as far as what we, we value the most, we do evaluate the whole application. So I think that's, that's really important. Um, we don't focus in on one thing. We look at the academic preparation um, and, you know, the GPA, what you said in your personal statement. So we look at everything as one application. So we don't zero in on one thing. Um, we do want to make sure that you have the right background and are prepared for the program. So that's... Uh, that is an important thing because we want to make sure you're ready for these rigorous graduate level classes. Mm -hmm. So that academic background is one thing. We spend a good amount of time looking at the transcripts just to make sure you're ready. Um, and then, I mean, as far as rates go, we don't have a, a, a minimum or a maximum. So, yeah. Right. We've yeah. taken, we taken all the students that meet the admission standards. Yes. So we would really encourage you to apply and, you know, you apply to the degree, but as Christina mentioned, there, well, after an evaluation, sometimes they say, well, maybe you should look at the MCS pathway, mm -hmm. and then you come in through that uh, channel into the program. And I think that's actually one really important thing is we would, mm -hmm. we reach out to you and let you know, hey, would you, are you interested in the ETS? Right. We don't see enough prerequisite mm -hmm. coursework, so we'll reach out to you or say, we think that you should consider the ETS or the, the MCS pathway. Mm -hmm. um, so we do reach back out to you uh, and give you options after that application is evaluated. Correct. Got it. So, so just to restate that you're recommending to people, it's better to get your application in and submitted and then that conversation can continue um, so that you'll be working and coaching them to make it the strongest it possibly can be. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's wonderful to know. So, um, Another question is, what if I come from a different field, like if I have a law degree? Are you only looking for people who have a CS background? I'd say we've seen a mix of backgrounds applying to the program. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's some who might have a law degree, but some, you know, they've been working as a, be a software engineer or um, they've gained that experience otherwise or, you know, they've self-studied and self-taught um, and they you know, they take that proficiency exam and they demonstrate they know it um, and then they're able to come into the program. Um, so, We've seen yeah. students without a background in computer yes. science come in mm -hmm. and they perform well. So we've had disciplines of mechanical engineering, mm -hmm. chemical engineering, mm -hmm. and they've been in the workforce in the IT field for over mm -hmm. a decade. And so as Christina said, that's why we provide you that online proficiency test mm -hmm. as a way for you to show us that you have the background prerequisite knowledge. So mm -hmm. no, not necessarily. We look at only computer science degree backgrounds. Excellent. Um, so uh, Vishwa is wondering, um, what type of information are you looking for in the personal statement? Are there any key details that somebody should mention? We really just want to know why you're interested in the program. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if there's anything you want to share about your background or you know, why computer science? Um, it's actually very interesting because we are seeing applications from other disciplines um, to see, you know, why, why they want to do computer science now. So that's really the, mm -hmm. um, the big part of the personal statement is explaining your motivation for wanting to do the program. Yeah. And what you want to get out of the program yes, that's as well. True. Because yes. we want to make sure that, um, you know, your background is going to fit with how we offer the program. Mm -hmm. And so when I wrote my personal statement, I started with how I really started to enjoy STEM. I talked about how I got into computer science engineering, some of my background in that field and what I do professionally now as to why I wanted to be in this program. And the, the content and the courses are really a great way to upskill, especially for those of us who graduated from entering school many years ago. Uh, things are constantly changing. So if you want to take a, a course in blockchain, you know, you might just want to do a few courses, not necessarily the degree, but we encourage all applications. Mm -hmm. Which that, that's actually a good, you could, you could even do the pathway just to take a couple classes yeah. if you wanted to, to try it out. So that's, um, that's also an option under the pathway too. Right. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And we see that a lot of people do try classes to make sure that they like it and first and that that is a, a typical pathway. Um, so Anjanava has is asking, because obviously there's, you know, GPA requirements and prerequisites, but how much weight do you give to work experience in the field of computer science and IT? So 
the work experience is really reflected if in your in your online proficiency test. Mm -hmm. And that's why we provide a low barrier option for you to show us that you have the prerequisite knowledge. We don't really give academic uh, admission standard credit for work experience, but it all shows in the application. And as Christina said, we look at the application holistically. And yeah, and if you, let's say an application comes in mm -hmm. and it maybe, you know, doesn't have all those prerequisite knowledge we need, we would then reach out to you and say, hey, here's the inf ETS information. So it doesn't, right. um, it, it, it's not a deny. It's a, hey, do you want to take this test and show us? And then you could go in and take the test and, um, and like Anita said, demonstrate that you do have that knowledge. Excellent. Um, so this next question is actually a really interesting one, and it's from uh, Shahin, and it's, um, can you explain how the classes are offered through Coursera, and then um, how do tests and projects kind of work, and, um, and how do you, like, are they proctored, how do I log in, those types of things, so any sort of detail around um, uh, the relationship between Coursera and ASU and the tests and projects. Sure, I'm going to take that one. Okay, absolutely. You can tell it. So, <laughs> this is an ASU online program in partnership with Coursera. So, you're still applying to ASU, you're admitted to the program, you still have access to the My ASU Services and Portal, you register for your classes just as any other ASU online student would. When you register for classes, uh, you will have access to your class when the session starts. When you click on the class, in the My ASU community, your class is actually being delivered through Coursera in the background. So just to get a little technical, it's a very seamless experience to you. To you. Um, the courses are delivered on Coursera, but all the um, grades and all the reporting is done through ASU and our portal. Um, in terms of projects, so there are lots of different kinds of projects that are sprinkled throughout the courses. So for example, if you're in the blockchain course, one of the projects is we introduce you to a public blockchain and then make it more application-based where we ask you to develop a small component of a private blockchain so that you understand the fundamentals and concepts. And the projects are chunk, um, and we give you enough time to get familiar with the project. There's access to live office hours where you have access to ask questions. We also have um, facilitators that are constantly monitoring the discussion forums in the course. Um, so the projects are very much offered in a way that are all encompassing, they're chunked, uh, you get good feedback immediately, there's a lot of auto graders to help you throughout the project as you work towards completion. Projects are very important in this program because we believe that the projects are really what is helping you understand the fundamentals of the concepts that are being taught but also how do you apply it to the workforce? And when we design our courses, that is a very key component that we look at when, we, when the faculty is building out the content for this program. Christine, anything you wanna to add to that? Um, no, I think you covered it very well. Um, I know there was a question about exams. Those are fully online through an online proctoring okay. surface. So the, um, Coursera uses ProctorU, and there's a, mm -hmm. a whole segment of the onboarding class that kind of walks them through um, how that works and how they get it set up and the technology behind that. So we have a, a, a good onboarding class to talk about all those different technologies and the live events and um, get them familiar with the platform before they actually start their classes. Great. Um, so there's a lot of questions about TOEFL. So I'm gonna kind of highlight a, a couple. There's one that this is somebody who's a US citizen, but they did their four-year bachelor's in India. So I'm assuming that if they studied in India, and not in English, they need to take their TOEFL. Is that accurate? Correct, Diana. So I got my computer science engineering undergrad degree in India. I'm, I've always been a U.S. citizen. I did have to take the TOEFL to prove the English proficiency. So yes, you will have to take that. And then somebody from Nigeria was saying, hey, Nigeria, we speak English, so TOEFL wouldn't be required from, say, countries like Nigeria, South Africa, UK. <laughs> So actually, that's a great point, Dan. There are 12 countries that we don't require TOEFL from. I know South Africa is one of them, Australia is another, uh, the UK is another. So we have a list, and I'm not sure if that's published on our website. I don't think it is published on the website. Yes, yeah. so, but there are some countries that we don't require TOEFL for. So if you want to get confirmation on that, definitely contact our enrollment team, 
uh, at mcsenrollment.asu.edu, and they'll give you a quick answer on that. And then um, there's somebody talking about a Duolingo English test. Is there any opportunity to use that? So we did offer that option. Um, so if you've already taken Duolingo, we will accept it. But as of last week, we are not offering the Duolingo test anymore. Okay. So our English proficiency options are, as Christina said, the TOEFL, IELTS, and the PTE. And then the last question would be around, what if I've been, um, you know, I was raised in a country that, that, that it, I'm not a native speaker, but I've worked, say, in the United States for 10 years. Is there any work experience that can um, kind of trump that TOEFL requirement, or it's just 100% across the board for everybody? The latter. Unfortunately, we cannot use work experience to waive the English proficiency in an English-speaking country. Perfect. Um, so then the, the next question that, be, um, just to clarify, um, that when this person is, our pit is asking, would that uh, MCS online degree, um, oh gosh, it just moved. Sorry. <laughs> I had it. Oh, there we go. Um, it, is it the same credentials as the on-campus degree? Yes. yes, yes. So your transcripts say the exact same thing as graduates of our on-campus program. So it's Master of Computer Science. Um, the transcript, the, the, the diploma or degree certificate you get at the mm -hmm. end does not say anything um, about it being online. So the, the degrees aren't online and on-campus are identical. So. And that's a really great question mm -hmm. because I know that in different countries, online is perceived a little differently. But also to add to what Christina said, the courses in the on-ground and the online program are exactly the same. Yes. Same syllabi, taught by the same faculty. So we don't differentiate between the two programs. Yeah, the only thing that's different is the delivery method. Correct, yes. that's right. Mm -hmm. Great, um, so then uh, a couple of questions about transcripts. So um, do they need to be official? I'm gonna take yeah, it or okay. <laughs> so, uh, at the time of application, we will accept unofficial transcripts, um, but there, there are some size limitation that it's one document, it has to be less than one megabyte. So I know that's presented some challenges um, for applicants, um, but, and it has to be legible. So sometimes that size limitation uh, can be a little bit challenging, but you can apply with your unofficial transcripts. Um, you do need to send your officials you know, if, if you're admitted, you do need to initiate that process to have them sent. But what it does is it allows us to at least be able to evaluate it and get you that decision. Mm -hmm. um, because we know it can take time to get official transcripts here, especially if you're, you know, an international student. That's a yeah. even a more challenging process or can be. Yeah, and that was the other person's question was like, well, gosh, it's going to take some time. So what do I do? So really for that person, you're recommending apply provide your unofficial transcripts and then, and at the same time, order your official ones so that then when you get in that you can, you guys could match the officials with the acceptance. Yes, just make sure, uh, you know, that that scan or that unofficial document that we can read it. Mm -hmm. So I know sometimes university seals and that the print they use on it makes it a little bit hard to read. So just make sure we can read it. It's a important, important component of the unofficial transcripts. Perfect. Um, there's been a few questions about career services and helping with placement. Do you guys have any information around that? Sure. So we have, um, we have access to the online network. Mm -hmm. We have a, a, a tool called Handshake mm -hmm. that allows you to connect with other employers. Um, so there is a bunch of services that are mm -hmm. around the MCS program as well. Um, and Remember, the ASU community is very, very large. We're the largest public institution in the country. And so we have a very large network uh, that you could tap mm -hmm. into through these different uh, tool mm -hmm. options. And even engineering has their own um, yeah. career center. Um, I've seen them do virtual career fairs. Mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, for an online student, that's a great opportunity. Right. Um, there's other, like, resume reviews and mock interviews they can do, even through mechanisms like, you know, like this, like video conferencing. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of tools available. Um, to assist you in the job search. And that information is available in our FAQ online, mm -hmm. so definitely go look at it to get the exact links. Excellent. Um, there have been a few questions about scholarships and financial aid. So mm -hmm. um, this one's specifically about scholarships available for international students. So we have 
some scholarships that are available on our ASU website, go to scholarships.asu.edu. Um, so if there's availability, there are definitely things you can apply for um, and try to get scholarships through that mechanism. And about financial aid options, mm -hmm. I know we have certain conditions that apply. Mm -hmm. um, financial aid is not very easily available to international students. Yeah. So there's some, there's some limitations, but definitely look at the website. If you have further questions about how that applies to you, you can again contact our enrollment services team. They have a wealth of knowledge in this area. And one thing to add is we lowered the price of this program substantially. Uh, the online program is less than half of what our on-ground program is because mm -hmm. we wanted to make this program accessible to you. And the $15,000 uh, price includes all the fees. So we don't have additional fees that we charge on top of the 15000 And so that is a very important distinction for you to know that the 15000 is all in. And including can, books, including books, including That's an important thing for engineering, <laughs> right, including books, including mm -hmm. proctoring services, including all of that. So as you're planning your program and you're deciding what courses you want to take, you have that financial information of fifteen hundred dollars a course so you can plan it out. Mm -hmm. And just to reiterate that it is charged based on what you take. Right. So um, if you only want to take one at a time, that's, mm -hmm. that's okay. And that's how tuition will be charged. Correct. That can help make it a little bit afford more affordable too. That's right. Yes. And that actually did highlight another question. Somebody was wondering, oh. can I do this full time? Right. I mean, I know that you can do it one course at a time, right? So it's a part-time program that can take a little longer, but like how quickly can you do it and can it be a full-time um, program for you that you can say put on your resume while you're applying for jobs for example so our classes are accelerated so they're offered in a seven and a half week format so they do move very quickly um, in comparison to say the on-ground camp on-ground classes which are 15 weeks so they move at about the twice the pace as the on-ground mm -hmm. um, so that um, if you're working full-time that can present a challenge um, with the accelerated courses so I guess it Definitely depends on your circumstances and what your other commitments are, um, but you can absolutely take multiple classes at a time um, and, and move through the program quickly. Um, I've seen, you know, three or four classes taken a semester, which is usually two classes at a time. So you can definitely do this at your own pace, what fits your schedule the most. Excellent. And then we have, a, oh, sorry, please continue, Anita. So, so Diana, I wanted to just add, I would just sort of estimate about 15 hours a week yes. per class. So you can figure out your schedule according to that mm -hmm. time commitment that we would recommend. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And then you have kind of an A and a B for each term. You have a fall A and a B, and you have a spring A and a B, and a summer. So there's five um, kind of sessions. Sessions, sessions. yes. Correct. So if you wanted to do two per session, because you want to be a full-time student, that would be like 30 hours per week of commitment, which is close to a full-time job. And then you could get through um, 10 courses? Yes, you could. Mm -hmm. okay. That is um, definitely possible. Yes, it would be a full-time job. Um, uh, yes, it would. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so a couple of people, Nathan and Krishna, are interested in understanding how this relates to a PhD. So Nathan asks, if I'm seeking a PhD mm -hmm. later, would this program fit into what I need? And then somebody asked, is this online program as good as a regular program in case I ever want to pursue a PhD program? So yes, it is equivalent to our on-campus program. So for that, the second question, is it as good as an on-campus program? Yes, it is. Um, it is a project-based program. So there's not uh, any sort of research component to it. Mm -hmm. So academically, you're going to take courses and and, and build a good background in these computer science topics. Um, the only thing you're not going to get online is maybe that research exposure that is so important to a PhD, PhD degree. So it definitely doesn't mean that you cannot go on uh, to do a PhD degree. You certainly can, um, but you just might have to, um, a learning curve, if you will, as learning how to do academic research, because um, that is one component in a project-based um, online master's program um, that you won't necessarily get exposure to. So hopefully that helps answer that question. Um, I mean, to summarize, you absolutely can go into a PhD after this, this degree is, is the takeaway from this. Excellent. And then um, there's been a few questions about kind of 
being on campus and on campus um, activities as well as services. So Julio is wondering, you know, can I uh, participate on any um, on campus activities and what about graduation? Yeah, so we have a lot of ASU mm -hmm. online students that come to campus for a graduation. Yes. And we would absolutely encourage that if it's possible for you to come to campus during the convocation ceremony. Um, there are also services and things you can avail of on ground as well. Um, and you could always contact Christina, yeah. who's in the city department. She could help provide further information on that. Yeah, and one thing I know that's important for on-campus services is the, the Sun Card, um, which is optional for online students. But if you're like a local online student, um, that might be something um, that you want to have uh, to access some of those on-campus services, because that's one of the first things they ask for. Anything on campus is, can we see your Sun Card? So, um, and you could use the library as well. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Yeah, and then Career Center on-campus recruiting events. You talked about the Sun Card. What about an ASU.edu email address? Yes, that's as soon as you apply. You get, you get, mm -hmm. Yeah, you get that anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep, that's automatic. Awesome. Um, that's super exciting. We actually encourage you to use that once mm -hmm. you apply, because that's where all the official communication is sent. That's, so. That's <laughs> yes. And even in the group projects, when you're interacting with your colleagues in the course, and that's also a great forum for the learning experience, we do encourage you to use your asu.edu address. That's awesome. Okay, so now there's been a few questions about kind of like transfer credit, like what if I started an MCS program somewhere, can I transfer credit in? Or if I decide to start this program, can I ever like apply and come on campus? Like how fluid is that, or do we really kind of view this program as one cohesive whole that you kind of finish, you know, soup to nuts? I can take that one. <laughs> so um, one thing, transfer credit is always up to the accepting institution. So for instance, our program allows six credits to be transferred that were completed at another school. So if you, you know, you started maybe your semester into another program, um, we have a, a review process for that transfer credit, and then it is a maximum of six credits. At the graduate level, it's almost always a be your better for graduate level courses. So even if you start our program, um, now our hope would be that you finish our program with us, but um, should you choose not to, you, then if you have bees or butter, um, it would be up to the accepting institution, but they're graduate level courses. So if you got a be or better, um, they should be transferable. Like one thing we look at is how equivalent is it? Is it rigor enough? You know, is it fit with the rigor of our program? Things like that. Um, and then there was a question. What was the second part of that question, Diana? The second part was like, well, what if I start online? Could I ever come and then become an on-campus student? Can I like start on the online and then later become an ASU MCS on-campus student? That's an excellent question. So our online program does have, um, also has a, a thesis component to it. So because of that, they're, um, they have, a little bit extra admissions requirements, like they do require the GRE and the letters recommendation. So those items would need to be completed to move to the on-campus program. So it is, it's an option, um, but there are a, a few extra components to move on to that online program. And if a visa is required? Oh yes, and then if you're, if you're international, um, then there's the, you have to request the I-20 and go through the visa process. Because visas are not given to online students, student visas are not. So you would have to go through that process if you are international wanting to come to the on-campus program. Excellent. And because you brought up visa, there was something I remember learning recently, and I wanted to make sure that um, I had this figured out. But if you're in the U.S. on a visa on an H-1B, can you be part of this program? Or are you already like in the country for a different reason? So, so, Diana, H-1B students, definitely, we have a large population mm -hmm. okay. of people on work visas. Okay. What The only limitation is if you're on an F-1 visa that was granted by another institution, yep. you cannot be part of the online program because your F-1 is applicable to the university that granted it to you. Got it. Yeah. And so I think that's one little nuance there. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks for clarifying that. Uh, I've seen a few questions now about the deadline. And so um, somebody was saying, well, gee, what's the fall deadline if I can't make the spring deadline? And so um, I'm assuming that you would say just apply now, you can always defer. Is that possible? Or 
that, that yes, deferment is an option if, if you need to. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, the fall, fall deadline will be July 1st. So if, I mean, I don't want to, that'll be posted eventually. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there are multiple semesters of enrollment. So I guess that fits. Um, the closest admissions term, which is what we're focusing on is May 20th. So mm -hmm. that's why, you know, if you, if you want to get that application evaluated to see if you need, you know, the proficiency exam or maybe the pathway, mm -hmm. um, a lot of times it might be better to get that in to know that earlier. Um, and then maybe still, you know, maybe you're taking ETS, you might choose to do fall instead. That's right. So yeah, I think that makes sense. Is that kind yeah. of, it's like, um, if you're someone who's trying to decide should I do summer or fall, you still can get your application and get the conversation started, make sure that your application strengthens, see where you might have some deficiencies so that then you can um, make a decision after you get into which, which mm -hmm. term you would start with. Yep. So, so Diana, can I answer some of the questions from the chat? Sure. Of course. So the prerequisite knowledge topics do need to appear in the official transcript, but if they don't, we have the online computer science proficiency test mm -hmm. available for you. Uh, there are some people who got their BSc IT from India but moved to the U.S. recently, and I am well aware of the challenges of transcripts. So if you find that it might be a little difficult for you to get transcripts, Contact our enrollment services team. They will give you some options. Um, I was in the same boat, so I fully understand that. The IELTS uh, test is under the general category is fine. We accept that. And are students able to take any class during any session? That is correct. Whatever classes we offer, you have an option to pick from those. For people that are working, we typically recommend you take no more than one class per session mm -hmm. because balancing work and the class load uh, is quite a lot, so we want to make sure that you take one class and do really well in that one class that you take that session. Um, the other question is, so yes, we don't offer every course on our catalog every session, so you will have to look at the schedule. I know blockchain is a popular class and we're offering it right now with our spring A session. To request for the pathway option, what we would recommend is put in your application to the degree program. Christina looks at the applications and she will reach out to you if she thinks you're a better candidate for the pathway option. Uh, you can't request directly for the pathway option. The other question is, again, demonstration of prerequisite knowledge is primarily on the transcript. So we want to make sure that if you don't have the prerequisite topics as course, academic coursework on a transcript, please look at the online proficiency test option. Uh, what kind of projects do you have through online learning? So just, this is a very important question. So I just told you about the blockchain course. We have a really interesting course like scalable data processing, where you actually do uh, programming on geospatial queries and you use Apache Spark SQL. So more of a recent technology that was introduced in the last three or four years. But again, we want to teach the application, and so having some knowledge of Python programming is very important coming into the course. Um, we have some really good projects on data visualization as well, which, where, we want to where we actually use Tableau as a mechanism to visualize and convey trends in data. So lots of interesting projects. Definitely check out our syllabus on the online website. And if you don't make the April deadline, uh, you can always um, have your application transferred to another session so mm -hmm. you don't have to pay the application fee again. Um, the end, let's look at the other set of questions. There's a lot of questions coming in. There are a lot, mm -hmm. yeah. And, um, and a lot of them are similar, right? Yeah. So um, there was one that somebody had looked at that they had, and, and I'm not sure if this was specific for this person or if they might be in, um, a different application, but he said that if there's in the personal information section under citizenship information, there's a mandatory question for what type of visa will you be holding? Is that where you're supposed to put the JN? Yes. Got it. So it's because um, he was saying there's no NA field, but basically the JN is the answer. Yeah, and that's, that just means international, not coming to the US is what that, that acronym, I guess, stands for. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Um, perfect. Um, we get this question a lot from potential students having H-1B degrees that are applying for um, green cards. 
I would definitely ha have you, your, the best thing would be is to check with your lawyer, mm. immigration lawyer who's doing the application for you. The MCS, we don't call it online MCS because your degree transcript says MCS, is accepted like any other degree program. So it would be best to check with your lawyer. Um, all right, so other questions? I know we're getting short of time. Yeah, we're getting very close. And most of these questions now look to be um, like that they've been answered already. Correct, um, yes. Um, yes, you can work and take courses online as well. So if you're working full time, you can take the, you can come home, have dinner and then take, go online at night and start working on your course. I'd say majority of my current students are working mm -hmm. full time right now. And 94% of all degree students on Coursera work full time. Mm -hmm. um, it's um, it's intended for that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the well, you're asking what are the maximum number of classes you can take in a semester? Mm -hmm. um, so by per policy or enrollment limitations, that's um, that's mm -hmm. actually uh, is not going to be limited. So that's mm -hmm. where uh, that might be a conversation uh, that we have about you know time management and, and balance because as we mentioned these are rigorous accelerated courses mm -hmm. um, so as we touched on earlier if you're working full-time uh, I'll tell you you know I recommend only starting off at one um, if you're not um, two seems like a, a good balance for graduate level courses per session but that could still equate to four per mm -hmm. semester um, so that's still I mean completing 12 credits of graduate level work in a semester um, is is actually quicker than what an on-campus student would be completing in the semester. Right. Um, so that would be my recommendation as an advisor as to a manageable load. And then they also ask me what is the minimum number of courses I need to take once admitted to the program. And so let's say I was admitted in fall of 2018. So the fall A session that ran from August to September, I took a class. And then I had a big work deadline, so I decided the next session I was going to take off, you could totally do that, as mm -hmm. long as you take one class per semester. Yes. And please note that our semester is divided into two sessions. So you can take one class per semester, mm -hmm. and then spring A comes along, you still have a busy work deadline, so again, you can't take a class. But then in March, you would need to take one class so that you still fulfill the minimum of one class per semester. What about the summer session? Does that count as well? So if you are starting the program in summer, you will need to take uh, a summer course. Mm -hmm. um, but then let's fast forward a year later and you're uh, a continuing student. Um, summer is not required as, an, as for continuous enrollment is what we call. But if, if it is the semester you're starting the program, you will need to take a class. So, you know, if you, if you get admitted for summer and it turns out you can't uh, or you cannot, then um, I, that's when I would recommend deferring to fall. That's correct. The other questions are about the software technology tools in the courses. Um, we do have a very detailed description of the technology tools that you would need for the course. They're all open source. We don't ask you to purchase licenses for software. Um, the other question is, there is a course catalog available. Um, and as Christina, do we have the website up? We do. So the, um, it's links.asu.edu uh, and then slash MCS. There's a courses tab and that outlines all of the planned courses for the MCS online degree. So there's some that have already been released and some still in development, but those are the courses that are planned for the MCS online program. Excellent. I think we have time for one more question, Anita. And there's one that I thought was interesting from Julio and he asked, are classes live or recorded? I was just going to get to the same question. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. The, the, the great thing is that the faculty lectures are video recorded, so you could see them at your own convenience, and you can see them as many times as you want, so that if you didn't understand a concept, you can go back to that particular place. And the last thing is Hannah said, can, I, can we reach you by phone after this webinar? Absolutely. We encourage you to reach out to us. We are here to answer your questions. And we would really like to see you apply and be part of the ASU community. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Christina, any closing thoughts? I guess the closing thought is definitely I mean, apply, get that application, and that's the best way uh, you know, to get your evaluation or questions answered. Mm -hmm. But we have a fabulous enrollment team. So if we weren't able to get to your question or you have follow-up questions, please contact our enrollment team. That's why they're here. So, and then that number and their email are both on the screen right now. Um, and I believe this will also be sent out. So that'll be easily accessible. 
Well, Excellent. Well, everyone, that. thank you so much for joining us today. Yes. It was so fun to see how many people joined us from all around the world. This is an amazing program, and um, there's this is recorded, and we will be sending out the recording to everyone who's registered and attended. So um, keep an eye out for an email later today. So I hope everyone has a great uh, morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are in the world, and we'll um, look forward to seeing your application. Thank you. Bye-bye.